Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. And today we got a Mr. Baldwin video. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because I don't know how long I'll have before I have to play the... Uh, around what time I'll be doing the new one tomorrow. Because he's premiering it and all that, so we'll have to see. Ladies and gentlemen, this one is... He, sh he should never have left his cabin. We're going to get right into it, ladies and gentlemen. Hit the like button, hit subscribe, and comment your thing down below. If you'd like to help me out with a donation, you can do a super thing or link to my PayPal. is in the description below. Let's go. 16, four friends rented a small... Oh, if you do leave a super thanks or uh, a donation to PayPal, you will be shouted out in another video. A rustic cabin near a forest in a little village in Russia. Their plan was to spend the night in this cabin, and then early the next morning, they would get up and they would hike this trail that would bring them to the summit of a nearby mountain. So on March 27th, the friends got in their car, they made their way to this little village, they found their cabin, they went inside, they hung out for a bit, and then by 2 a.m., they had gone to sleep. Little did they know, outside of their cabin, in the forest, lurking in the darkness, something was watching their cabin's front door, waiting for one of them to come outside. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button hands you their phone and tells you to please take this once-in-a-lifetime photo of them, agree to do it, but leave your finger over their lens. Also, please subscribe to- Oh, I thought he was going to say, like, take a selfie. Like, agree to do it and take a selfie of yourself instead of the moment to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. When most people picture Russia in their minds, they picture European Russia, which is literally the part of Russia on the western side that sits in Europe and is by far the most populated part of Moscow. the country. But European Russia only accounts for 23% of the total territory that is Russia. The other 77% is to the east of European Russia. It starts at the Ural mountain range and it extends all the way over 5 million square miles to the Pacific Ocean. And this vast, mostly forested expanse, which is 50 times bigger than the entire United Kingdom, is called Siberia. And Siberia is absolutely brutal. In Siberia, it is almost always freezing cold, literally. The average annual temperature across all of Siberia is 32.9 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is 0.9 degrees above freezing on average every single day. In addition... Damn. I don't want to live there. Nope. Nope, I'm already, I hate it when it's like... I hate it when it's like that at all times. Nope. I'm good. I'm good. To the extremely deadly weather that exists basically year-round in Siberia, Siberia is also home to a bunch of huge deadly animals, such as the brown bear, which is the same as the infamous grizzly bear in North America, the gray wolf, which by size alone makes virtually all other wolves look like little puppies. Gray wolves can grow to be nearly 200 pounds. And of course, there is the highly intelligent Siberian tiger, who is perhaps perhaps one of the only predators on Earth that is known to seek out and kill people for revenge. For example, in 1997, a hunter named Vladimir Markov was walking through a Siberian forest when he came face to face with one of these Siberian tigers, and he ended up shooting the tiger before fleeing, except the tiger didn't die. Instead, it got up and secretly followed Vladimir all the way back to his cabin, and then this tiger camped out outside of the cabin until Vladimir came out again and the tiger pounced, killed him, and ate him. And so- Oh my god, I love Siberian tigers. That sounds amazing. This tiger, this tiger holds grudges. These tigers hold fucking grudges. You will cross his path and it's like, oh, okay, 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 no, no, you shot him, that's fine, that's fine. Just stalk him in time, just wait till you come out. Just wait till you come out, it thinks. Just wait till you come out, comes out, fuck you, just get your ass. 
So unsurprisingly, Siberia has an absolutely minuscule population oh, yeah, relative to its massive size. However, there are some adventurous people out there who are drawn to Siberia for the same reasons that most other people avoid it. Yeah. These adventurous people see Siberia as one of the last truly wild places on our planet and they want to experience it for themselves. And that's f I'd visit it. I ain't living there. I'd visit it with like a bunch of people, not by myself. I'd be visiting with like a whole group of people. That way, if someone, you know, if any time I'm doing anything out there, I'm like, you're coming with me in case the tiger comes and gets my ass, I can throw you in front of me. And one of these highly adventurous people was a young man named Colin Madsen. Colin, who came from a very successful American family, was a big outdoors enthusiast who at some point in his youth began researching Siberia because he fell in love with its rugged natural beauty. He quickly began researching not only Siberia, but Siberian culture and Russian culture, and also at some point he became fluent in the Russian language. Then in 2013, when Colin was 22 years old, he left his home in Missouri and moved to Siberia. He settled in one of Siberia's few population centers, a city called Irkutsk, which is located in the southeast of Siberia and right along the edge of Lake Baikal, which is the world's deepest freshwater lake. I love these photos. You will always hear me putting old, you know, photos of photography and all that. I love this photo. Colin's Siberia plan was twofold. He would go to school while he was there and he would go out and explore. And at first, his plan went perfectly. He was accepted into Moscow State Linguistic University in Irkutsk, and very quickly he made friends who were eager to accompany him on his adventures out into the Siberian wilderness. From his arrival in Siberia in 2013 to 2016, Colin did well in his studies, and he spent countless hours exploring the forests and mountainous areas all around Lake Baikal and right outside of Irkutsk. In fact, Colin became so familiar with this region that he began volunteering with a nonprofit in the area that went around marking new trails, which meant Colin was literally venturing into the wilds of Siberia and just marking the trail as he went. So when Colin's family heard about what happened to him in 2016, they could not believe it. In March of 2016, Colin and three of his good hiking friends, one was American and two were Russian, decided they wanted to go on a hike together. They settled on hiking to the summit of Love Peak, which was a mountain located a few hours away from Irkutsk in a small village called Arsh. Again, love this photo. This mountain looks fucking amazing. Sean. This hike was nothing compared to the gnarly Siberian wilderness hikes all four of these guys had been on before. The trail that led up to Love Peak, it was fairly steep, but it was incredibly well marked, and all four of these guys had hiked it several times before. However, because Colin and his friends were so experienced at hiking in Siberia, they knew that even the easiest hikes needed to be respected because Siberia was still Siberia. There were dangers that lurked everywhere. And so the- I love that. They're like, look, even this is the easiest trail for us thing, we can't be looking at it like it's so easy. We gotta respect the fact that there are dangers everywhere and we, if we don't fucking look at this seriously, we're gonna end up in, uh, we could end up in trouble. Men called ahead to the village of Arshan and they rented one of these small rustic cabins that's in the village that sits right at the base of Love Peak and it's kind of tucked away in this forest. And so this cabin would serve as their sort of base camp and would allow them to arrive in Arshan, get their gear together, and then when they were ready, they could begin this hike to the summit. And so a few days later on March 27th, Colin and his three friends loaded up their car and they drove west to Arshan. And when they got there, they stopped at a local store and got some supplies and then made their way to their cabin. Their cabin was just a single room with a few beds inside of it. It was enough to protect them from the elements, but really nothing more. As for a toilet, the cabin didn't have one, but there was an outhouse outside that they could use. So after the friends moved into the cabin and claimed their beds and put their things down, they all sat down and began prepping their gear and eating some food and chatting. And then finally at 2 a.m., they decided they needed to go to sleep because their plan was to get on the path up to Love Peak by 7 a.m., 
which meant they needed to get up at 5 a.m. to make their final preparations. So at 2 a.m., the lights in the cabin turned off and the friends all fell asleep. And then three hours later at 5 a.m., when the lights came back on again, it was immediately clear something was wrong. Colin was not in his bed. His friends assumed when they looked over at his bed and saw his personal belongings were all still there, that Colin must have gotten up and headed outside, maybe to use the outhouse or go for a quick walk, and they just hadn't heard him leaving. And so the three friends initially just kind of shrugged off Colin's absence and said, you know, he'll be back any minute, most likely. And if for some reason he's not back soon, he'll certainly be back by 7 a.m. because that was the agreed upon time they would leave for this hike. But as the minutes ticked closer and closer to 7 a.m. and Colin still had not shown up or tried to call them or do anything, the friends started to worry. It just didn't make any sense that Colin would just get up and leave without telling them where he was going. Finally, at 7 a.m., when Colin still had not shown up and the friends' cursory search of the outside area near the cabin had yielded no results, they decided they had to tell someone. And so they wrote a note addressed to Colin and they put it on the front of their cabin door. And this note basically just told Colin, you know, if you come back here and you see this note, know that we're looking for you. So stay put or tell someone you're here. And so after putting up this note, the friends left the cabin and they headed to the nearest police station where they reported Colin missing. The I am very glad because probably wondered that they were going to be like, oh, He'll make his way back at some point. We'll just go on the hike and come back. I was, there was part of me that was worried they were gonna do that. They were gonna do that. Thank God they had a bit more sense. Police would eventually launch this huge search in and around Arshan, both in the forested area right around the village and then also up into the mountains near Love Peak. But despite this huge effort, no one could find Colin, at least not at first. A couple of months ago, I was laying in bed when I heard this strange tapping sound coming from my downstairs. An emergency, like what? On Monday, April 4th, so eight days into Colin's disappearance, a group of searchers were looking in the forest about one mile away from the cabin where Colin and his friends had been staying. And they look up ahead and they see there is this clearing and there's something in the middle of it. And so the searchers begin moving their way towards this clearing, ducking under branches and stepping over brush. And when they get close enough, they can see Colin is in the clearing and Colin is deceased. He was laying flat on his back with his left arm extended out to the side and his right arm extended but closer to his body and both of his hands were clenched in tight fists and on his hands and his wrists were visible abrasions and cuts which later would be determined to have most likely been caused from someone or something holding on to him trying to restrain Colin. Colin also had visible abrasions and cuts on the front of his neck. Colin's clothing, which consisted of a long sleeve thermal shirt, heavy pants, and hiking boots, were ripped and torn in several places. And interestingly, Colin was not wearing socks under his boots. Now that seems inconsequential, but Colin had had surgery on both of his ankles and had scar tissue on his ankles that if he didn't have socks on, those scars would rub against the inside of his boot. And he said it was very painful. So he always wore socks. Also, Colin's body showed virtually no signs of decomposition, and all of his wounds and abrasions looked, quote, fresh, according to medical personnel. In short, Colin looked like he had recently been in some sort of physical altercation, and whoever or whatever he was grappling with had eventually overpowered him and killed him, although it was not clear how he actually died. Russian authorities... I feel like we've been told about a Siberian tiger and we're in Siberia. I feel like a Siberian tiger came hunting for his ass. This guy talked some shit to a Siberian tiger and it went, I'll come, I'll come. And then it got, it went, it went, fuck you and got him at the end when he went to go take a piss. 
authorities were very quick to suspect Colin's three friends who had been with him, but they were brought into the station and they denied having anything to do with Colin's death and they all passed their lie detector tests. After that, Russian authorities quickly closed this case by concluding that, well, if his friends didn't do it, then that means Colin must have been high on drugs or drinking alcohol or both, and he just wandered out of his cabin and he got lost in the woods and he died of hypothermia. He froze to death. The what? <laughs> Russia, Russia, I look, I don't have issues with you, KXW, right? You're blocking all of our shit on that damn channel. But what the hell are you doing here? A man has been, has marked scarred, he's been clearly held again, like, restrained, he's clearly been attacked in his throat, and you're like, that's what happened to drugs, right? That's what you do if you're drawing drugs. Russia, are y'all lazy? Are you all that, look, just say an animal attacked him. Say he was killed by a Siberian tiger or something like that, doesn't make him a crime. Doesn't, we know the dangers, I don't know why you're, why are you trying to make this? Why are you trying to make this more controversial than this? This didn't need to be conspiracy theory. You just say you got killed by an animal and you know he died. That's what happens. The end. However, Colin's parents just could not accept. Obviously. That as being what happened to their son. There were a lot of reasons for skepticism, but the main one was that Colin was an absolute expert at navigating this particular region of Siberia. And so the idea that he would leave his cabin for a quick walk or something and get so completely lost that he would die eight days later seemed way too far-fetched. And so Colin's parents hired a US-based private lab to do a review of Russia's autopsy of Colin to give their opinion if the autopsy was accurate or not. And this US-based lab pretty much immediately found that the Russian autopsy was not remotely accurate. Number I'm not surprised the Russian people just was, they, you know when they did it, they did the autopsy all drugs in on fucking alcohol and you got drunk. They got, they, they, yeah. You know what I bet he did? You start so much. You know what I bet he did here? Oh, he went on there. He went to chill and he was drinking like we were and he was smoking like we were and he, he got lost. I'd get lost on this shit. That's what happened. Number one, Colin was not under the influence of. I know that's not an accent, trust me. I wasn't trying to do a Russian accent. Just want to make that clear. Alcohol or drugs. He was sober. Although, technically, he did have very small amounts of THC in his urine. THC is the chemical that is found in marijuana. But the amount was so little, it basically meant he had consumed the THC days before he went missing. And so he would not have been remotely affected by that small amount of THC in his system. Number two, the lab determined that Colin almost certainly did not die from hypothermia. Instead, all signs pointed to Colin dying from being suffocated, meaning he was murdered. Someone crushed his airway Clearly. or in some way Clearly. restricted him from yeah. breathing, and that's what killed him. And three, based on the lack of decomposition, the freshness of the injuries on Colin's body, and the lack of animal predation on his body when they found him, indicated that Colin did not just wander out of his cabin and immediately die somewhere in the forest. Instead, he was alive for most of the time people were looking for him. Meaning when they found him, he likely had died within hours of being found. And so these findings by this US-based lab kind of create a general theory about what must have happened to Colin. After Colin left the cabin in the early morning hours of March 28th, maybe to go to the outhouse or to go for a quick walk, when he went outside, someone or something was nearby and they either lured Colin to them or they straight up ambushed Colin and took him away. Now we have no idea what happened to Colin after he was abducted, but we can safely assume that after being abducted and taken somewhere, he was alive and he stayed alive for several days until on the eighth day of his disappearance, Colin was killed, likely by- Okay, I got a theory. It's a st- it, 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 it probably some- I don't know- I don't know how- I'm, I'm sticking with a Siberian tiger. Just by the way he described it. Um, what if the tiger attacked him, Colin escaped, 
and then the, it went ran into the forest, and the tiger pretty much just stalked and like tortured him in a way for what, eight days before finally killing him. I don't know. Like he said, this the way he described this. This tiger holds a grudge, and it probably enjoys doing it. So by his captor, either at the spot where he was found, or he was killed somewhere else, maybe in the forest, and then moved to the spot where he was found. Many people believe it was the Russian government who targeted Colin, they kidnapped him, and they killed him. And their botched investigation into his death was actually a calculated cover-up. Why? What did, what did Colin have? that would make the Russian government kill him? What does he know that would make them kill him? Because that ain't... For them to put that much effort in, he must know something they don't want revealed. Colin had participated in at least one peaceful environmentalist-led protest in Siberia, and after... Oh, hell no! You won't tell me that's... No! <laughs> no, I'm unconvinced. Nope, I'm unconvinced of the government here. You can't, nope, you're not, you don't have a good argument. If your whole thing is he went to a peaceful protest and they were, and they killed him for it. No, no, I don't buy it. For the protest, Colin apparently got a written warning by the Russian police not to attend another protest. But why would Colin, who was just one of many people involved in these protests, be singled out by the Russian government and killed for his participation? And why would the government elect to kill Colin when he was with three of his closest friends who would immediately notice his absence? It just doesn't add up. Today- Fair. Fair. That's a good argument. He, they, they killed him knowing he'd immediately be- people would want looking for him. Also, again, we are in Siberia where danger is lurking. I feel the government, someone when the government would have just said it was an animal attack because people would have washed their hands of it and not thought twice on it. There would have been no investigation, no nothing. Because you can't plan for an unpredictable animal no matter how hard you try. Hey, Colin's parents are still trying to figure out what happened to their son, but unfortunately, their son's case is closed in Russia, and so no one on the Russian side is talking to the parents or giving them any new information. And so as a result, they and the rest of us are left to wonder who or what was lurking in the shadows when Colin stepped out of the cabin that morning. And then where did they take him? And what did they do to him for nearly a week before they killed him deep inside of that Siberian forest? So, th ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this reaction video. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all for the next one.